you know, it has to stop. It has to, like, effing stop. I have talked to five parents in five different states in the past two days. And you know what they all are talking about? The bullying that they are receiving as a parent. The retaliation against their kids at school. Because the parent is speaking up, the parent knows their rights, and the parent wants their child safe and included at school. The retaliation has to stop. This is like, no, 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 no. I mean, I am talking about parents telling me about how every day their child is suspended, secluded, restrained, given work that is like ridiculously supposedly modified. You know, and sometimes I think, oh, you know, the teachers just don't know how to modify. We need to help teachers know how to modify work. Maybe parents can modify some examples and, and give it to the teachers. And yeah, that'll be cool. You know what I think I'm learning from these past two days? Is I believe... Some people are on purpose setting up your child for failure. And their intention is to make the general ed class so hard, so torturous, so everything for your child that they will melt down, they will start showing other behaviors for their communication, you will get a call to come pick them up. They'll be hiding under a table. It's like, how in the world do people think this is okay to do to your child and other kids? I mean, I had planned this show, right? I even had this like handy banner here. We're going to talk about how surprised we are when good things happen, how frustrated by the bad things, and talk about all the missed opportunities at IEP meetings. But you know, we're, we're gonna still talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, the missed opportunities, but not just at IEP meetings because this is happening in classrooms. So I don't know if, this has happened to you. If what I'm describing is something that you know a friend has had to be dealing with. But the bad, the bad is, I think some of this is happening on purpose to defeat parents, to beat them down, to make them say, forget it. We're going to move to another district. Or for parents to say, forget it. I am going to homeschool my kid. My kid used to love to go to school. And look what's happening now. So I don't, I don't want this just to be a Charmaine Tanner venting process. However, venting is helpful. So does any of this sound familiar? Do you know of, have you experienced this? Is it just this anomaly that I've had in the past two days that I've had five people in five different states talk about the same thing, the same problems, the same like huge 
trauma inducing horrible problems. <sighs> so originally I was going to talk about an example of the bad that happens. And I was thinking about general ed teachers and when they come to IEP meetings, so many times they are the ones that are the quietest. They hardly speak, right? And I think, you know, I don't think maybe people are really talking to them and, and saying why their voice is important at meetings. I also think that a lot of general ed teachers are silent in IEP meetings because they totally disagree with having this kid in their class, having your kid in their class. I I just I I just can't imagine educators setting kids up for failure. And that's what I'm seeing. And, and it's disgusting. And it has to stop. And it's not going to stop until we have enough people rising up and say, I ain't going to take any more of this. And the reality is, I know as a parent, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your child. You have to protect your family. So if things are really being, you're, if your child is really being harmed at school, you have to do something different. And sometimes that is saying, you know what? Enough is enough. And I'm gonna take my kid out for a while. We're gonna homeschool. We're gonna find out how learning is fun again. And maybe then later I'll come back to this broken education system. So Amy, thanks for making a comment because I don't want this to be all of my words. She says, I feel like in many cases it doesn't look extreme, but they are not doing enough to include, train, accommodate. The other teachers, aides, etc., just roll with an archaic system rather than rock the boat disagree with the need to include or work think differently. Parents, in my opinion, are at a total disadvantage. I think it, help, it happens frequently. So what do you think? Do you agree with Amy? Do you see this happening frequently? Yeah, I mean, the lack of training is huge. You know, and so being an advocate, um, I was a special ed teacher, I was a general ed teacher, my son Dylan has Down syndrome. You know, all of those roles that I've played have like really helped me kind of digest and, and look at things in different perspectives. And um, it's just incredible that, um, we have come to this point. And I also want to tell the good side of the story because there are fantastic, tremendous teachers in every state, in every city, and hopefully in your school building, at least one teacher that can help you plant some more seeds, right? But planting seeds is not going to do it, right? When your kid is being harmed. I mean, schools are coming up with clever ways of getting around regulations like, oh, well, nobody at the school does any restraint and seclusion. We, we don't have any of that going on. Oh, you call the school resource officer, the policeman with the gun and the handcuffs, and he comes to school and he puts your child in the seclusion room and shuts and the door and leans and pushes on the door to hold it shut. 
Oh, that's that. Our school doesn't. We don't restrain and seclude anybody. Oh, you mean it's the school resource officer that restrains your child every day? Not not the school staff. Hey. And what if this was your six year old child? Are you effing kidding me? You're calling a policeman? <sighs> okay, save me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, <sighs> Kim, 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 Kim. Kim says, maybe it just needs to be said that we have teachers, not special, not general ed. All of the children are the students of everyone. Yeah, right? And we go to conferences about that. I do workshops about that. I write newsletters about that. <sighs> and we're still in this place where we know better and we ain't doing better. You know, and I like Kim's point about the silos. Yes, 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 Joanne. Yeah. Join the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Guy Stevens has been really helpful to so many people around the country, including us in Idaho. Guy Stevens has helped us. And we got some beginning legislation passed last year in Idaho, which is, uh, you know, the smallest of baby steps, but it's it's coming. Um, so, yeah, so just to touch back on Kim's point for a minute for about the silos, you know, we have this special ed silo, we have this general ed silo, and you know, I've talked for years about like, how, how can we dismantle these two silos and have one wonderful, fantastic, child-centered inclusion, evidence-based education system. And then when I was getting ready for what originally I had, I had planned for today's live, I was gonna talk about a missed opportunity. Um, and I'll just give this example real quick. Um, and it was at a, an IEP meeting that I was at recently, and the, the OT was talking about how she was working on the student on one of his goals, which was using a name stamp and being able to stamp his name on paper. So, you know, if he had worksheets and things like that, he was able to do that. So she was saying how she was trying different kinds of stamps, which I thought was great, you know, different sizes. She actually found a smaller one that worked better than the bigger one and, you know, self-inking. So she was doing great. I mean, so maybe this is partly a good example too, right? So she was really brainstorming and trying things with the student. And she was saying it's still really difficult, you know, it's, you know, just to get it on the piece of paper and blah, blah. So I said I was there as an advocate for the student and I, and I asked the OT, I said, so I wonder if, you know, the name stamp that you found that works really well, if he can also use that when he's in general ed. And so if he has a worksheet or, you know, a project or something, he can you know, practice and use his name stamp. And she said, well, no, he's he's really not ready for that. I, I was like, what? And she said, no, I want him to get better with me first before he tries it in other places. In my mind, it's like missed opportunity so one is the OT thinking that this is her goal and she's got to work on it and not collaborating with other people, right? So it's a huge opportunity miss. However, what it made me think of is even within that silo of special ed, 
we have our own little silos. I'm the OT. These are my OT goals. I work on these. I'm the SLP. I work in my room on these goals. I'm the PT. I pull out so they can walk in the hall. And we have all these silo services and supports going on in that silo of special ed. So that's like another huge thing, right? Like when are we, you know, we talk about interdependence for our kids and natural supports. And it's like, well, what about interdependence with our staff? How do we cross train? How do we support each other? So keep your comments coming. So I get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, so uh, Allison, hey, Allison is a wonderful advocate in California. Uh, she says parents need to read the laws way more. Yeah, but look how confusing the laws are, right? I mean, um, I think what we look at, so what do we want parents to gain by reading the laws more? And can we give parents that win, that gain, without having them to read the laws more? So part of that, right? I mean, it comes from training. I mean, Allison and I are both in COPA, and which is the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates. And um, I mean, yeah, we do a lot of training on that. And yet, and that's the thing that blows my mind when I talk about these five parents I've talked to in the last two days. These are parents that are like on the ball, know what's happening, know their rights, have been in this advocacy journey for a number of years, have filed for due process, have hired attorneys, have hired advocates. And they are still being bullied and their kid is still being retaliated against. No. No, 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 no more. No. So Abby, hey, Abby, Abby is a wonderful parent in Kentucky. And she says, um, let me get this up here. The education system is set up for everyone to fail, huh? Our system is set up for everyone to fit into some box, and when they don't, too bad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at our kids that don't want to be different. Please don't give me a different, you know, worksheet. I want to do the same as everybody else. So what does that tell me is... Yeah, it's pretty much conformed to this box. And we don't give choices. If you have a document like a 504 or an IEP, you know what we could do? We could give you accommodations. Accommodations. Well, how many of you know that IEPs aren't followed very well with fidelity and 504 plans have even less chance of really being implemented. So this is a lot of bad, right? This is a lot of missed opportunities. Because the missed opportunity when everybody has to do this worksheet, unless you have a document and I can give you an accommodation or maybe a modification of crossing out half the worksheet. Everybody does this. And when you're that when you're like that, when you're in that environment, your kid doesn't want to have to look different. Your kid doesn't want to have to say, I don't fit in. I have to do it this way. So then that's like 
looking at universal design for learning, right? That is a huge missed opportunity that we're not using in our schools. And Amy, 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 thanks for being here. Amy said, um, I forward your site to everyone. Kim makes a great point. The administration has to support and demonstrate the change needed. Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, and we're looking at the amount of training that needs to ha happen. And um, so that's, to me, like another huge advocacy issue as far as how do we get um, specific training written in IEPs for staff and for parents and for it not to be like, you know, we're pointing fingers at you and you don't know what you're doing. We have to help you out. It's like, no, this is something different. It's okay. We all need support in different ways. However, some, if training does get written in IEPs, um, usually what happens is it's like so generic and it's like a one day workshop if you're lucky or it's a half hour during the staff meeting where they'll talk about something and say, yep, check that box. We did staff training. So that's something that I think is a missed opportunity is for us to be more specific about training and IEPs. And I do have, you know, some suggested language um, that you can use and in, in what you want to be really specific about. Um, yeah, Abby, you're right, changing minds. Yeah, changing mindsets is hard. And that's really, right? That's kind of the business that we're in. Um, you know, and our, our kids are living that every day um, and are out there. And they should not be uh, set up for failure. That's, that's, that's not a goal that a teacher should have for a kid in order to get the kid out of her class. And again, that's an example of bad. And please know, there are many, many good, great, innovative, creative, inclusive, universally designed, trained, implemented teachers out there. However, when you're an advocate, you usually don't get those parents calling you and saying, I just have this wonderful news to share. I get the parents calling me that says, the policeman is restraining my six-year-old at school every day. <sighs> okay. <laughs> if you are new to this group, I'm usually, um, this is not usual content. However, I'm like beyond doing the usual. So, Allison, thank you, thank you for being here. She said, I've tried endless collaboration for certain things. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you have to turn to the federal and state statute and regulations and point them out to the district. You can do it without being aggressive. I got nowhere on, on an issue until recently I invited the team to mediation. See, you could give a casual invitation. Let's go to mediation together. They turned around in days and agreed to support what I wanted. Join, join COPA. Yes, yes, yes. Parents can join COPA. Join state parent advocacy groups and get things changed at district and state levels. Yes, 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 and more yes. Um, yeah, and I don't know why I don't talk about parents joining COPA no more. That's like a huge mistake on my part. Um, so for sure, I, I need to give you guys the, the link for COPA membership. And they even have um, scholarships for families. So it's a great resource. They have a listserv that you can be on and ask questions. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's a good resource. And like I said, Alice and, and I are COPA members and are incredibly thankful for all the support. Um, yeah, so, and Amy says, yes, the decisions are being made by people who constantly under expect. Yes, it's totally siloed training and it frequent enough or in depth enough yeah because that's the thing right if unless you have i mean there's um research on staff development like unless you have ongoing you know coaching um your one shot workshops and trainings for teachers your one workshop you know training for parents isn't going to help unless you have that ongoing coaching. So that's why like we have the group connecting for change and Abby and Allison are in our community. Um, yeah, because teachers, you know, and there's this whole, you know, I don't know, um, like climate, I can't think of the right word, but, you know, for, for a lot of teachers, it's so nice when the day starts and they can close their classroom door and they can be with their group of kids. Um, and there's wonderful communities that happen, you know. However, when those teachers have their classroom door closed and they're really not open to a colleague down the hall coming in and saying, oh yeah, sure, I'd love to watch your science lesson. I wanna learn how you do that because you're, I think you know the science the best in the class, you know, in the school or, um, and you know, even be open to sharing what they do well, let alone having a visitor come in their classroom and be, judging them and making them feel defensive. And so that whole, and again, it comes back to what Abby was saying earlier about the mindsets, really. I mean, right? The old saying, you can lead a horse to water, right? Um, however, there we have to keep looking at there are some things that we've done successfully as parents and we want to make sure we hang on to those strategies. And there's some things that so far haven't worked very well. So we got, we got to still be looking at some other, some other solutions because we're, we're passing missed opportunities every day with our kids. Our kids are losing out every day when things like this are happening. So what else? What else? Uh, uh, um, yeah, Abby says, um, so districts don't really care about the laws. Yeah. I mean, they know attorneys are expensive for parents. If you live in Idaho, there's one special ed attorney that works at Disability Rights Idaho, and that's the only attorney we have in the whole state. So do you think districts are going to be like, oh, yeah, this parent's got the money. This parent's going to hire that one lawyer we have in the state. It's not like it's a deterrent, like you think it would be, right? Right. Okay, Allison, thank you for continuing our conversation. She says, join um, big nonprofit advocacy disability groups in your state and get helpful tactics for your particular situation and join them in pushing through the systemic changes, the laws. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, right? I mean, we have to have... Um, stronger coalitions 
And yet, if you're the parent that's getting a phone call to go pick up your, your child because they've been set up and they've had this behavior reaction, it's like, uh, I don't got time for the laws to change. My kid is crying. My kid doesn't like school anymore. So it's and, right? It's not that either or. It's and. We got to be doing both. We got to be taking care of ourselves with self-care because this is incredibly stressful. We got to be soothing to our kids which I know you are. Uh, and maybe right now, that's, that's what you need to do. And then maybe it's the other parent that so far things are going smoothly or this year things are going better. And maybe it's that parent's turn to say, you know what? I'm going to be on that task force this year. And we ain't just talking about fluff. Like we're looking at what legislation can we propose? Because there are parents that are more interested in doing that policy level change. So we need to cultivate <laughs> seed, grow more of those people. Because not every parent is meant to be the all-star advocate for your child and take all the bullying and retaliation you're given and then also expected to work on policy change. Sometimes that timing isn't right. So what do you think? Is there a way we can try and get policy made and also protect our kids and keep them safe. It's like, shit, you know, what's it been 50 some years? Uh, Allison says, I have no faith in teachers, timely, useful prof professional development. I went to the webinars myself and created a book of strategies and resources for the teacher and sold her on using them in the class by finding other parents who thought they would help their kids as well. So see, that's an excellent example of good. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Allison. I like when people are helping me not just be in the doldrums here. Um, yeah, and Allison like did such an amazing thing. I mean, and again, not every parent has, you know, the time to do that. However, if you look at, um, you know, and you kind of dissect what were some of the things that she did in order to make this happen. Um, so, you know, she's, like she had said earlier, been advocating for a while, invited people to mediation. They said no. <laughs> Um, and they started working on some changes. Uh, and then the other key that was so nice is that she found, I think it was like three or four other students in the class that could use the same strategies. And so then it opens up, right? And then the teacher's like, ah, I think I know some other kids that could use this. And it's like, it's not this, like, uh, oh, geez, now I got to change all this stuff for this one kid in my class and be like Eeyore or something. Um, however, it's, um, yeah, it's like, look at how having this student in your class with these needs helped everybody else. Um, one of the examples I love to share because it just is so clear in my memory when I was a second grade teacher, and this is a long time ago. <laughs> so it's it's good that it's still in my memory. Um, 
I had a little girl that wore hearing aids and we used an FM system in the classroom. So I had like a microphone I would wear. So, um, you know, she would be able to hear better as far as, you know, directions and reading stories aloud and all that. And on Fridays, we would watch a Reading Rainbow video. Who loves Reading Rainbow? <laughs> and at first I thought, oh, you know, I can put my microphone for the FM system up like by the VCR because they were VCRs. And, um, and maybe that would help, you know, this, my um, student with the hearing aids hear it better. And then I thought, ah, ah. I need to learn how to turn on closed caption on this TV at school. Um, and you know, when I did, when I turned on closed caption, guess how many other second graders benefited from seeing the words in print go on the screen? Like a lot of my kids, right? So here it was an accommodation I was making for a student and instead, it was a wonderful wide choice for everybody. So the more we can get teachers to realize, like these things that parents are talking about, the examples that parents are showing you, like these are things that other kids in your class could use too. It's like, woo, that's where the good comes in. That's where that teamwork, that interdependence comes in. So I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. Um, keep your comments coming. And Abby says, school staff really doesn't get the training they need to provide the services a lot of kids need. Yeah, and um, yeah, and it's that, it's that training and it's the ongoing coaching. Um, in the open mindset, right? We need a, we need, uh, I need to ask AI how to open teachers' mindsets. <laughs> um, oh, Amy, she said, I didn't know that parents could join. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's cheaper for parents. Um, and like I said, there's scholarships too. Uh, Allison, could you look up the COPA? site and post the link right now um yeah and you can be on the listserv where the advocates are and and sometimes there's attorneys on that too i think the attorneys mainly keep to their attorney um group and allison says yes she's in my group, it's called Connecting for Change. Join and we can brainstorm situations. Yes, yes, yes. We are a group of people, parents united in our vision and are not taking no for an answer. So um, if you want information about our Connecting for Change group, let me know. And Barb, 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 Barb is here. Um, and Barb is a friend of mine, used to be a special ed teacher, used to be an inclusion facilitator and administrator, and we should bring her out of retirement. We need you, Barb. So she talks about defensive advocacy. And, and I just talked to Barb about this this morning. Um, and so, Barb, if you're still here, can you write in your definition of defensive advocacy? Because I don't want to misquote you, but I love what she had shared with me today. Um, yeah, and I know, Allison, she said, by the way, I don't mean to imply it was simple or everyone was in a position to affect state change. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, and, and that's why, you know, if that's like not your bag, it's like not my jam or whatever, <laughs> um, find somebody else, <laughs> you know, and, and connect. I mean, there's so many ways that, you know, your parent training and information center in your state, that would be a place that you could connect with. Um, because often, well, pretty much I would say 100% of parent training information centers are, um, you know, in touch with policy at the state and federal level. 
and so that's, you know, that would be one place to go. The other, you know, like if you have arcs that are um, active in your community, if you have, you know, Down syndrome groups, you know, like a, Abby, what's it called with the one that's the Down syndrome group from Cincinnati? Um, like there's, you know, different centers like that in, in some of the bigger cities. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. There's, and, you know, I don't want to just, let me get a drink of water, throw resources at people. Because... I mean, that's, you know, if you're interested, I would rather have people ask for it <laughs> instead of me just, you know, continually to give it to you. Um, because, I, you know, different people want different things at different times. And, and what I'm, you know, what I really see for so many parents now that are feeling defeated, that are feeling beaten down. This is a time we really need for you to care for, care about yourself. Um, and, and I know it like sounds trite and it's like, oh, geez, Charmaine, yeah, self-care, self-care, who's got time? But it's like, you know, sometimes you just have to pull back and take a break. And that's okay. And that is okay. Because there's another parent behind you that can step right up. And I hope you don't take a break forever. <laughs> However, you have to do what you have to do for your own emotional good, for your child's mental health, for your family's health. So, yeah, there's, there's opportunities and you know, you have to like pick one that like, like aligns with you. And it's like, yeah, this is, this is the person I'm connected with. This is the person I'd like to, to learn more with. It could be, like I said, from somebody from your parent training information center, somebody from your ARC, somebody from your local autism group. But connecting with other people is like really, really important. Um, so we have some new comments. Um, yeah. And Abby was saying now hearing aids have Bluetooth. I know. I wish my husband would wear it and use it. <laughs> I want him to be connected to the TV. So he hears the TV through his hearing aids and I don't have to hear the TV. That's what I want in life. Um, yeah, and Abby says, you know, she's great that Allison's had some success with all her work. And Abby is, I mean, Abby is fighting the fight as far as one parent with one child with Down syndrome that's included in their district. Um, so if sometimes it feels like that David and Goliath kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, so Barb, she says, great example, Charmaine, as an inclusive general ed teacher, there wasn't one modification adaptation I made, which didn't benefit many others. Yeah, exactly. I know. Oh, good. Um, Allison put the COPA link in there. So yeah, parents, you can be members. Join, join, join. Thank you, Allison. And Barb. Okay, I love this. So she talks about defensive ad advocacy. She said it's just like defensive driving, where we are always driving while looking out to avoid danger issues. Defensive advocacy is learning enough to be able to anticipate what could happen in our advocacy and the nonsense that is pulled by the education system so as not to be surprised and be able to deal with it proactively. So this is another goal for us, right? 
Um, and I think as our kids get older and we've been to, you know, more meetings and seen how things go, um, I think you, you do anticipate what's going to be coming in and you have that fear. And I think one of the things that parents anticipate well is retaliation. And that's one thing that keeps people from acting because who wants to put their kid through that emotional turmoil of being retaliated at school? <sighs> so, yes, there is room for improvement. Um, and we need to be a part of that. And like I said, if, if there's a time when you need to take a break, take a break. Take a break. And hopefully you'll have supportive people around you then can help kind of nourish and encourage you so you can feel positive and hopeful again. And that can happen. That can happen with the best friend in your community. That can happen in a group that you're in. But reaching out and, and making sure that you have somebody you can vent with, somebody you can brainstorm with, is like super important. So, and I think about, now I can't think of his name, Holtz. Um, he does NBC Evening News. <laughs> What's his name? Shoot. Anyway, he always, his tagline at the end of the news is always, um, take care of yourself and others too. And that's what, I think that's what we do as parents. Well, taking care of ourselves, we probably don't do so well. We are those helping kind of people that like to take care of others. So make sure you have somebody that can also be that support person for you. Um, because, yeah, it's this is like way too stressful of a life, and we don't want this to continue. Um, and Allison said, I've hit rock bottom. And I'm doing right now, all I'm doing right now is training to become a special education advocate and learning things to eventually apply for my own kids. I have nothing left in me for school, Halloween, fundraisers, etc. I figure my advocacy and donations of printer ink, etc., is valid parent input or involvement. Sorry. Yeah. And I, it's, you know, I'm incredibly sad when, when I hear you say, like, I've, you know, I've hit rock bottom. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's where that, maybe the growth and the new things come from. I don't know. I don't know. Um, however, I do know, yeah, there are there are other parents that aren't doing the work that you're doing, Allison, that can be there for the parties and the decorations and the PTA meetings. And, and that's why we need this. I'll go back to my, my fan, my fantasy of collaborative advocacy. Um, and that's why we need a circle of allies because I have a certain skill set. I'm detailed oriented. I've been an advocate for a number of years. Um, I, I have a certain skill set. 
I don't have other skill sets or I don't have time <laughs> for other skill sets, right? And so that's where that inner dependence for ourselves as parents comes from, where I would hope our school staff would come from, where our kids hopefully are experiencing that inner dependence in their, in their classrooms with their peers and classmates and friends. So yeah, we have to find different people with different, um, you know, different interests, different things that they want to pursue. But when we, and when we work together, then we have more potential for bigger, really lasting change. So thank you so much for being here. Let me see if we have any other new comments. Um, Lester Holt. Yes, thank you. Take care of yourself and each other. I think that's how he says it. So I think we'll let um, Lester Holt have the final word here. I appreciate you being here. I know your time is extremely valuable and the community of people and the support that we have when we get together a couple of times a month here um, is precious time. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I, um, I also did want to make an announcement because I love when there's new opportunities. So guess what? I don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. Um, so coming up on November 8th, it's going to be an evening masterclass. And we're going to be talking all about uh, communication and how AI can help us. <laughs> so if you are not a fan of using artificial intelligence, I understand that. If you are intrigued and curious about um, using artificial intelligence as one little sliver of your advocacy toolbox, you can go to iep.today forward slash 118 masterclass <laughs> and um, sign up. It's free. It will be on Wednesday, November 8th and it will be in the evening. So um, if this is something that intrigues you, I'm going to be um, talking about how we can, um, you know, use our voice, our thoughts, write things, and see if AI can do some tweaking and some helping. Um, and that can be with tone of voice, that can be the types of sentences you include in your email. We're going to be going over six must-have sentences uh, for email or in verbal conversations with staff and people. So just that little tip in itself is going to be amazing. So free masterclass, go to iep.today forward slash 118, a masterclass. So I bid you adieu and know that we are here for each other. Um, and until we see you again, I am Charmaine Tanner. I am passionate about your child being seen for the wonderful person that they are, for them being welcomed, embraced, seen for the gifts that they have. And that's, that's what I help parents do with my advocacy. So thank you for being here. Take care of yourself and each other. <laughs>